to talk to you about Russia a little bit and tell you some things that I think about that part of the world that was the Soviet Union for much of my life. It's a land of great big rivers, great big plains, physical plains that is, and harsh winters, short hot summers. Well, let's go down to a river and uh, that might be a good place to talk about Russia because when we look at water resources, they have some of the most in the world, like Canada, like the United States. Russia is one of those up there with a lot of fresh water. So let's go down to a river here and uh, talk a little bit about Russia. Okay, this is the Nehalem River. It's the lower Nehalem. You know, when we talk about rivers, if we're talking about a lower something, the lower Nehalem, the lower Nile, the lower Sabi, South Africa, we're talking about the part of the river usually that is lower to sea level, where it often comes into the ocean or another body of water, and it's slow moving usually, and it's wider. And so when we talk about the lower Nile River, for example, that's where the Nile Delta starts and where it comes into the Mediterranean. If we're talking about the upper Nile, we're talking about where it starts in Ethiopia and Kenya and higher up in elevation. And then as it uh, slows down and comes down to the lower part. This is the lower Nehalem. Maybe we'll see some of the upper Nehalem too, where there's rapids and other things. Anyways, uh, this is a tidal river. You can see it's low tide right now because you can see all the uh, mud here at the water's low on the sides. Anyways, this is one of the great salmon fishing rivers out here. What about Russia though? Let's talk about Russia a little bit. Uh, yeah, when we look at Russia, you know, we're talking about a huge country, right? We're talking about a country with uh, 11 time zones. We're talking about a country that stretches all the way to the Pacific Ocean. We're talking about a country that has major climate ranges from tundra and arctic all the way to deserts. And lots of different kinds of people, lots of different ethnicities we find in Russia as well. Not everybody is Russian who lives in Russia. That was even more true when it was the Soviet Union. You know, what makes this place so different? What makes it European? What makes it a separate entity? Well, you know, when we think about why Russia is different, we have to go back about a thousand years in the history of Europe and Christianity. When we go back a thousand years, we go back to the 11th century and we're thinking about uh, the role of Christianity. The, Christianity was not separated into all these different denominations at that time, but Christianity was pretty much uh, one unified, mostly unified religion. And the center of authority was not in Rome or Western Europe at all, but it was in the East. It was in Constantinople. It was in what is today Turkey. It was then the Byzantine Empire. But in the 11th century, differences between leadership became too strong in the church, and there was the first great division of Christianity, or sometimes called the Schism of 1085. And what happened was that the Eastern Church leadership decided that they had the correct way of doing things without going into detail. And the Eastern Church became known as the Orthodoxy, the Orthodox Church. We know it as the Russian Orthodox Church sometimes, or Greek Orthodox, but uh, it's just the Eastern Orthodox Church. When we look at what happened in the West, Western Christianity then became under the sole reign of the Pope in Rome although there were several popes at times. But Western Europe developed along its own ways, and the East was sort of separated because of these differences. The Eastern Church was literally excommunicated, and Russia developed on its own. Russia was separated long before there was a Soviet Union, long before, before there was an Iron Curtain. This separation of the Russian people through adhering to the orthodoxy of the East uh, allowed for different development of a culture and economy and political system that was far different than say what evolved in France or England or Germany or Italy or somewhere else. So Russia for a long time has been a, it's been a quite different place. 
I'm looking at the bird up there for a second. I think it's a pelican. Pretty far away, but it's got a nice view on the branch up there, looking down on the river, looking for a meal. Anyways, let's get back to Russia. So Russian culture developed differently over a thousand years of its history. And its leadership under the title of a Tsar or Caesar was pretty uh, consolidated. The Tsars of Russia had a lot of power, had a lot of authority. Power was not shared. As late as the 20th century, the, the last Tsar of Russia had to personally sign every divorce granted in Russia. Okay, the Tsars were also the head of the church. Just like in England, Queen Elizabeth is the head of the Church of England. There's no separation of church and state in a lot of the history here. Okay, but Russia, you know, here's this vast land that at the beginning of the 20th century, there was great poverty there, you'd have to say. A lot of, most people lived in extreme poverty, uh, so poor that they could not emigrate as they might have wanted to the United States in any large numbers. Hence, we did not have that many Russian immigrants, you know, for example, compared to immigrants from Germany or Poland or Italy or other places. But Russia was its own world. And when we look at the geography, the physical geography of Russia to start out with, think about that. Think about the Great Plains of Russia, the Russian steppe that I want you to identify what that means, the dark soils of Russia, the Chernozems, what else do we have there? Well, the Russian winter is legendary. It's defeated armies, right? The Russian winter has defeated the armies of Napoleon, the armies of Hitler. And I don't think World War II would have been won without Russian involvement. Europe would be a very different place. What happened in the 20th century was something quite different. In the 20th century, we have the creation of the Soviet Union. Let's talk about that just briefly here. The Soviet Union was created after World War I. The Russian Revolution went on for several years, 1917 to about 1920. And the Soviet Union, which in included what all these countries that are now independent, like Ukraine, Belarus, Estonia, well, later Estonia and Latvia, Lithuania, uh, what other places were part of the Soviet Union? Well, Kazakhstan, all of Central Asia except Afghanistan, you could say were part of the Soviet Union. It was a great experiment in a new type of economic political system following the ideals of Karl Marx, a German philosopher. Marx was never in Russia. He lived in England, actually, a lot of his life and in Germany. Anyways, the Soviet Union was something the world had never seen before. It was a closed off place to the outside. And it was a place that, uh, well, we couldn't visit too easily. When I was a kid, I never met anyone from Russia. I didn't know anyone who'd ever been to Russia. We didn't have any products in the United States from Russia. And this was the Cold War. We cut them off and they cut us off. We were the superpowers now, the Soviet Union and the United States. You know, so we were trying to do something a little bit different and they were trying to do something different and we were at odds with each other as how the world should be run and how things should go. And the space race was part of that, right? We look at the space race and we look at, uh, you know, the outcome of that, that we collaborate now in space, us and the Russians. That's pretty amazing, really. I would not have guessed that years ago. That would not have been my guess. So, but what I want you to think about as you read the chapter on Russia and the chapter on Central Asia, think about how similar we are as peoples, the Americans and the Russians, rather than as different. Who else could go into space? Who else can destroy the world from the nuclear power? Who has, can take these great big ideas and plans and implement them? Who has great amounts of land? like we both do, and great amounts of rivers and waters. Not too many other countries can say that. Think about European countries. They can't say that. None of them can. But we have a lot in common with the Russian people, okay, in our history, in our culture, and our outlook on life. We live very differently, but uh, there's great traditions on both sides. So as you read the chapter, pay attention to environmental issues, some of the history and culture of Russia, the former Soviet Union, and how that impacted the development of Central Asia as well, I want you to read about, okay? So that's about it on this one. I think I'm going to stop right here, okay? See you later. 
You know, there's a good look at the banks at low tide if you're curious about a tidal river. Okay, so you can see how high the water comes in at high tide. Well, this is low tide right now. So it goes out to the ocean about, uh, oh, I'd say about a mile from here. All right, so that's all for now. That's your geography lesson on Russia, Central Asia, and the lower Nehalem River here in Oregon. See you later. You can see the smoke's about gone, which is good. My voice is recovering. So it's a first sunny day in a while. Take care. Bye-bye.